uh, as a whole with Murad Chowdhury, who's head of business treasury at Royal Bank of Scotland, and Simon Nixon, the European editor of the Wall Street Journal's Heard on the Street column. Nice to see you both. Many thanks Good for evening. coming in. Well, let's talk about uh, these extraordinary loans from the ECB to the Eurozone banks. Let me get this right. The European Central Bank cannot lend directly to sovereign states. So it lends to the banks and urges the banks to lend to the sovereign states. Does this make sense? It's easy to see it as some sort of quasi quantitative easing through the back door, but technically speaking, that's still accurate. It's provided funding facility, as all central banks do, to its member banks. And if they, provided they have sufficient eligible collateral, they can take advantage of this funding facility. And a three-year funding facility makes a lot of sense at the moment, so one isn't surprised to see such a large take-up. You mentioned uh, collateral. As I understand it, the rules on that have been dropped, have they not? They've been eased throughout the world on both sides of the Atlantic since the crisis first came upon us, absolutely. It doesn't have to be just sovereign debt. There's all manner of securitised debt and other types of assets that banks can put up as collateral, correct? Simon, isn't there something intellectually dubious about this, uh, in that the ECB says, OK, boys, fill your boots at 1%, and then you can go off and start lending to sovereign states at 5 and 6%. This is just a locked-in, immediate profit. It almost gets in the box marked too good to be true, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I, I think, firstly, this isn't actually the main reason why the ECB did it. The main reason the ECB did it is that there are about 700 billion euros of bank bonds falling due next year, including about 300 billion in the first three months of next year. Mm -hmm. And if the banks can't roll that debt over, then they're going to start shrinking their balance sheets and stop lending to the real economy very quickly. So the first objective was to stop that. And that's actually quite important. Uh, the lending to the sovereigns, I, I agree with you. On the face of it, there's a juicy profit to be made there. But, you know, it's very, I, I'm not convinced that the banks are going to start loading up, having, you know, having been penalised by the market for the last year for actually owning sovereign debt. I don't think the banks of their own will are going to start loading up in large quantities of sovereign debt. And I don't think the market really thinks that they will either. Is that right? Because it's become known in the trade as the Sarko trade. So mm. Cozy was urging <laughs> yeah, yeah. them to do it. Um, but you're right. Uh, many of them have their balance sheets stuffed with dodgy yeah. Eurozone debt. Uh, why would they load up? Well, yeah. Instant profit. Well, I think, you know, at the margin, some will. So Italian banks may lend to the Italian government because if the Italian government goes down, the Italian banks go down anyway. So I think you'll see within countries you may see some support. But what you won't see is that two or three, three years ago, when the last time the, the ECB offered big loans, you know, the French banks were piled into Greek debt and Italian debt. I don't think you'll see any repeat of that this time. Uh, so, which is one of the reasons why I think you've only seen 500 out of the 2,000 banks that were eligible actually taking up this offer. Uh, so, you know, I think... The, I think that the sovereign debt buying bit, the Sarko trade, has been slightly overplayed. But I don't think that one should therefore dismiss this manoeuvre as being insignificant. The actual, uh, if, if it stops the banks shedding loans and running down their balance sheets very quickly at the start of next year, that's actually quite an important uh, as a new development for the... In no, the right. you're, you're, you're nodding. Well, I, I, let certainly. me just put this to you. I, I read a, a really interesting question on, on a website today. It, it seemed sort of obvious but fundamental. Where is the European Central Bank getting all this money from? It doesn't have a big vault with 500 billion euros That's in it, does it? That's a very good it? question. And in fact, you, you alluded earlier to a circular kind of a trade here whereby the money is just being rotated around between central governments, banks, central banks, and the European Central Bank. You know, it raises funds through the markets in the same way that central banks ever do. It, of course, also is an arbiter through the printing press, if you like, in the way that the ah. Bank of England is. But we don't want to get into that route because that's a, it works differently in the Eurozone. Does I it? Regret, it, 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 it can the ECB not simply print money? No, it, does, <laughs> it doesn't have that mandate in the way that, say, a, a sovereign authority with its own monetary policy control would. Right. But the fact is, you know, it, it is true, the comments we're, we're hearing, it, it is good that it removes the funding pressure on banks, and that is the number one objective, and that is a good thing. So everyone can be agreed on that. But it's not difficult to see that certain banks that have already got their term funding sorted out, you know, the last three years they've been issuing term debt, they don't have a funding problem, they're well funded, they take advantage of the three-year facility to make, as you say, all most risk-free money. It's not completely risk-free because of the haircut. You know, they don't give yeah. one for one. But they can make almost risk-free money through this type of trade. And so, conceivably, some of them may hold Southern Eurozone debt where it suits them. Potentially, those banks for whom it's their domestic economy, Spanish banks, Greek banks, Italian banks, and so on and so forth. Isn't this, uh, Simon, yet another example of um, uh, sort of political uh, delusion and denial in the sense that 
The real problem here, as I understand it, is sovereign insolvency. Greece is bust. It can't pay its way in the world. So what are we doing? We're flooding the system with more liquidity, which just buys time, but it doesn't fix the issue, does it? Yes, well, I mean, I, I think you're, you're right that, that uh, Greece has a very particular problem which has not yet been sorted out. The jury's out on Italy and Spain, and there's obviously a delicate balance to be struck there. There's, you know, when Italy could borrow at 3 4%, nobody thought that it was necessarily bust. If it's borrowing at 7%, it is. Now, to the extent that these loans help remove some of the tail risk and help stop the what economy. What do you mean by tail risk? Well, but they, they, they remove some of the, they, by taking away some of the risk that the economy will shrink even more rapidly than because the banks are unable to lend. It takes away, you know, if it takes away some of that, that risk, then, you know, the, the question is, can, can the Eurozone somehow get these borrowing costs in Italy back down to a level at which it doesn't have a solvency crisis? So I, mean, I think that the jury's out on this, some of these other countries. There's still obviously a, pr a problem around Greece, but and I think that the, the, the market this week, you've seen Spanish yields come right back down to even mm. below 5%. Uh, you know, so the question is, can that happen with Italy? And then you could see, you know, you know some, it's, things start to look slightly less bleak. But, you know, I agree that the, that the problem is that Greece remains this running sore and they still haven't yet built a sufficient firewall and still haven't really resolved how they're going to put Greece back on its feet. Has this Has mitigated indeed, the problem or that, simply no, deferred it? It's absolutely deferred it. If the, the, whole, the reason 2012 will be as volatile, if not more so, unless we get some denouement, which gets really bad, the reason it will be as volatile, if not more so, 2011 is because they have not addressed the problem. By they, I mean the EU leadership, the Eurozone leadership. The problem is one of central control of budgets, you know, sovereign fiscal probity, if you like. This is buying time. Whatever measure, whether it's the European Stability Fund, OK, it buys a bit of time. Whether you then announce some sort of pact, growth and stability pact version 2, it buys a bit of time. Not, not that I think that would work. It didn't work the first time round. This is buying some time. It buys a little bit of confidence. I don't think Spanish and Italian yields will stay depressed. I mm -hmm. see them rising again in 2012. And and I don't think this solves the problem in any way. If the, the, the issue is one of long-term viability of the euro as a concept in its current form. We yep. need to address the whole fiscal union debate and actually take steps to implement something in that form, as well as make the ECB a lender of last resort. That's a good parallel measure, but it doesn't substitute from the real solution, which is this fiscal union issue. Let me be mischievous here and invite you to uh, criticise the boss, uh, Sir Philip Hampton. He said next year he can see Greece popping out. Would you agree? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> it's, uh, your own it's, yeah, no, goes on no, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's a it's a difficult call on how the euro will play out and what the membership of the euro will be in 2012 and indeed the, in 2022. Mm. It's a difficult call. All I would say is that you know, to be preserved in its current form, they do need to take that fiscal union step as well as address the lender of last resort issue. They have to be done in parallel. What, Otherwise, we could see some change. What do you think, uh, Simon? Uh, this time next year, will we have? Uh, an identical membership of the eurozone. Well, I, I think you know, intellectually, I can you know, I find it very hard to see how one gets through the next year and the issues that we just discussed about fiscal union, political union. Uh, you know, but uh, but I find, but maybe it's just uh, denial. Or, but emotionally, I find it quite hard. I mean, I first I find it hard to see the, the chaos that would ensue if Greece was to fall out and the, the contagion effects. I well, find it very chaos hard to now, see. of course. Though. There is, and I think you know. But I also think though that yeah, I think it's it's an odd day. I mean, to say that the ECB doesn't act as a lender of last resort on a day when it has just pumped you know, four five hundred billion into the financial it's system not, as a lender of last resort. So it's a lender of last resort to banks, but it's not. Yeah. A, no, it's a lender of last resort to banks, which is what a central bank should do. It's not being a lender of last resort to sovereigns, which is a slightly different issue. But you know that, that that so there obviously is still you know some issues there that need to be resolved in the eurozone. But I do think that um, you know say intellectually I can't see how we get how they get through this. But I, but but if you emotionally if, but, 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 well, you're so you know, wedged to the euro, I, I'm not wedged to the euro. I'm not the euro fan at all. I can tell yeah, you. Yeah, but yeah. if you if you had to if you had to if you nail me to the nail me to the floor and say, do yeah. you think it'll still be together in a year's time? I'd have to say that I suspect that in there will all the seventeen will still remember the euro this time next They'll year. They'll fix it somehow. But the crisis will not be over. Simon Nixon, Murad Chowdhury, many thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. This is Jeff Randall live coming up after the break.